Warning, potassium chloride and perchlorate are powerful oxidizing agents. This experiment involves high temperatures and molten salts. Wear gloves, masks, and face protections when performing the experiment. Hi guys, here is MIH. I had already made potassium perchlorate by the thermal disproportionation route using a variety of methods and you can check the previous videos first to get an overall idea. But briefly, potassium chloride is heated in a ceramic vessel until it decomposes to potassium chloride, potassium perchlorate, and oxygen, and the potassium perchlorate is harvested by water recrystallization. However, all of the previous methods require large amounts of water and ethanol and are rather not reliable in terms of yield or quality. The method I'm showing here is the best perchlorate process so far, as it minimizes both wastewater production and ethanol consumption, and consistently give high yields. The only disadvantage is that sodium perchlorate cannot be made by exactly following this process. The thermal decomposition part is the same, but the purification is not. So making ammonium perchlorate may be quite difficult. To start, we measure out 50 grams of pure and preferably dry potassium chlorate in a porcelain evaporating dish. It doesn't have to be perfectly dry, but it needs to be recrystallized at least once to ensure purity. You can see the flake-like appearance of my potassium chloride, indicating that it has been recrystallized. The impure and wet potassium chloride as shown here cannot be used, as it gives poor yields and impure perchlorate product. Apart from the chloride and the dish, the only thing we need is an electric furnace with decent power and insulation, as the potassium chloride needs to be held at 400 to 450 degrees Celsius for around 30 minutes. I found this 500 watt stuff sufficient when a layer of rock wool is added to keep the heat in, but an 1000 watt furnace probably doesn't need this many insulation. Also, try to avoid furnaces with exposed heating elements, as the potassium chloride decomposes to form oxygen, which may corrode the heating wires and cause severe dangers such as overheating and shortcut. It is better to use a furnace like this, where the heating element itself is encased by a steel tube. The porcelain dish containing our chloride was then hoisted above the furnace using an iron stand. Note that no plastic parts or joints should be used near the furnace, which is why I used two clamps instead of one. The stove is switched on, and the wood pieces are adjusted to insulate the dish better. Now some notes about safety. The heating tube should never touch the bottom of the dish, or it may crack or shatter, releasing molten potassium chloride onto the furnace. Trust me, this is exactly what happened with my last dish, and it was really not fun to deal with. Also, the heating tube has a current running through it, so if the heating tube touched the metal ring under the dish, the entire iron stand would become charged, and you can be electrocuted by an accidental touch, and I'm also speaking from experience on that one. Anyways, the heating tube quickly turned red hot thanks to the large amounts of insulation. As the potassium chloride heats up, it pops as residual water evaporates. Wear proper eye and face protection, as hot potassium chloride flakes may hit your face at any time. Also, pay attention to potassium chloride jumping out of the dish and into the furnace, which will decompose in the heat and create plumes of gas. To solve the popping problem and to shorten the melting time, the porcelain dish can be covered with aluminum foil, but don't cover the dish for too long, as the high oxygen concentration and high temperature may quickly oxidize the heating elements. After 10 minutes of heating, the potassium chloride has nearly completely melted, producing a clear liquid with a slight yellow tint. Using potassium chloride with lower purity results in more yellowish liquid. Now if you look closely at the liquid surface, you can see some tiny bubbles forming and rising to the surface. This is oxygen gas, usually seen right after the potassium chloride completely melts. Over time, the rate of oxygen gas production gradually increases. If you look closely at the liquid, you can see some black particles moving rapidly on its surface. This is probably metal oxide contaminants that catalytically decompose potassium chloride to oxygen and potassium chloride, which is the side reaction we don't want, as it does not generate potassium perchlorate. Nonetheless, this reaction still happens even if the potassium chloride is absolutely pure, but accelerates when there are traces of transition metals present. To demonstrate this, I stick my thermometer probe into the molten salt, and you can immediately see the gas evolution increase around the steel probe. This is also the reason why you should use glass encapsulated thermocouples or IR thermometer if you decide to measure the temperature of the molten salt. I don't have these, so I just opted to eyeball the reaction based on the rate of gas evolution. Now at this point, I should emphasize the positioning of the porcelain dish above the furnace. As I've said before, the dish shouldn't touch the heating element, but it needs to be as close as possible to the source of heat. 
If you see the molten soda constantly evolving little amounts of gas, then its temperature is not high enough, and you should adjust the position of the dish or add more insulation to raise the temperature. This is especially important for stoves with lower power, such as mines. Now you may ask, why don't I keep the temperature around this point and limit the amount of gas evolution, which then limits the decomposition of chloride and therefore receive a higher yield? The answer is that the disproportionation of chloride to chloride and perchlorate requires a higher temperature than the decomposition of chloride to chloride and oxygen. So if you only lightly heat the chloride for a long time, you get a lot of decomposition and really low yield. Instead, just like what I'll be showing in a minute, you raise the temperature and finish the reaction as quick as possible to limit decomposition and increase the yield. Here, I've added aluminum foil to the dish, and after a few moments, the rate of gas evolution visibly increased. After another 5 minutes, or 30 minutes from the start of the reaction, the mixture evolves a lot of gases. This is the stage where most of the perchlorate is produced, so a high temperature should be maintained. The size of the bubbles are larger than that of before, and they rise up to the surface slower, indicating that the molten salt is more viscous. This increase in viscosity indicates that potassium perchlorate, along with potassium chloride, is produced. These salts, unlike pure potassium chlorate, do not melt at this temperature, so the net result is more solid forming, which makes the molten salt more viscous and less transparent. Also, the molten salt spits out a lot of chlorine dust, which you can see on the table, so be sure to put away any flammables and wear eye or face protection. To demonstrate how much dust was produced, I placed a piece of aluminum foil over the dish, and you can see a lot of salt depositing on it. As more and more larger bubbles evolved, the surface of the molten salt gradually loses its flatness and becomes uneven, indicating a further increase in viscosity. Eventually, it would froth up and expand in volume. Be careful at this step, as the expanding mixture may overflow the dish and destroy the furnace. Turn off the heating, such as what I did here, would help subside the reaction a little. Obviously, the better way of eliminating these risks is to load less potassium chloride at the beginning of the experiment, but oh well. The mixture may start solidifying at any point, forming a crust on the top or sides of it. This marks the end of the reaction, so you can turn off the heat and wait for everything to cool down. The mixture would contract while cooling, so it can be easily separated from the dish when it completely cools down. But rather than waiting for everything to cool down and waste the heat, I think the better way is to prepare a metal plate and carefully pour the mixture onto it. As you can see, it rapidly solidifies and contracts upward as it hits the cold metal plate. Needless to say, this step is quite dangerous as molten salts may ooze off the sides and burn everything on its way, so make sure that the plate is large enough deep enough and flat, and make sure your hand holding the crucible tons is steady. Just as a side note, the metal plate should be preferably made of aluminum instead of steel or iron, as rusts will catalyze the decomposition of chlorate and also contaminate our product. The great thing about this procedure is that you can immediately return the dish to the furnace and add more potassium chlorate to start a new batch, which allows for much higher efficiency since the production is continuous. As the salt mixture cools down, it will develop cracks and may spontaneously crack which is good for us since we need to grind the mixture down later. Be careful and stay away from the cooling salt mixture just in case it cracks forcefully and send broken pieces flying around. When the salt mixture fully cools down, it can be easily shattered by a light tap. The salt mixture sticking on the porcelain dish can also be easily removed by applying a slight force. The mass of all the salts are around 42 grams, so we lost 8 grams of mass as water vapor and oxygen. Mass loss is typically around 10 to 20 percent, so this run is quite decent and not a lot of side reaction occurred. The salts were then added to a pulverizer to fully grind it into a fine powder, but a blender may be sufficient. Mortar and pestle is not recommended because it doesn't produce a fine enough grind that our next step needs. Now you may be wondering that if this powder mixture of potassium chloride, chlorate, and perchlorate can directly serve as the oxidizer for the rocket without further purification. I haven't tried to use it to make a rocket, but I think it's a bad idea since you don't know the correct proportion of fuel to oxidizer, and the extra components such as potassium chloride may completely stop the rocket fuel from burning. Anyways, our blending is done, and the lid of the pulverizer is carefully opened in a well-ventilated area. As you can see, the particles are so fine that they escape into the air like a gas, so be sure to wear a mask or respirator when doing this. After trying my best to get all of the powder out of the pulverizer, I have around 40 grams of powder in the beaker. 
As the pulverizer would later be used to grind some pure potassium perchlorate, I don't really care about the remaining 2 grams. Anyways, to the powder we then add the same as of water, in my case roughly 40 grams. This serves to purify our potassium perchlorate by dissolving away the potassium chloride and chlorate. This is why we need to have an extremely fine grind at the beginning, as unlike a recrystallization in which we dissolve everything, here we are only partially dissolving the solid. Hence, compared to recrystallization, this procedure requires much less water and thus produce much less waste solution, but at the cost of a slightly lower purity. Still, I found the purity to be sufficient in rocketry. Then, the slurry was stirred rapidly on the magnetic stir for 10 minutes. At this point, I'd like to mention that the temperature of the slurry impacts the yield and purity of the perchlorate product as well. As the temperature increases, the solubility of all three substances increase, so you'll receive less perchlorate product after filtration, but you can also dissolve the impurities more easily, therefore giving you a product of higher purity. At lower temperatures, everything reverses, and you'll get more product for lower purity. However, a perchlorate product contaminated with chlorate is quite dangerous to use in rocketry as chlorates are much more reactive than perchlorates. So after balancing the yield and the purity, I chose 30 degrees Celsius as the sweet spot for this purification step because the difference between the solubilities of our product and the impurities is greatest. Therefore, make sure that your slurry is cooled or heated to the appropriate temperature for best recovery. Meanwhile, I closely inspect the porcelain dish for any cracks, which may be very dangerous. And apparently, the porcelain dish survives the reaction perfectly, with no signs of corrosion or cracks. Ceramic is the ideal material for this reaction, as gloss partially softens at the reaction temperature, while metals catalyze the side reactions. After filtration, we're left with a slightly off-white potassium perchlorate product. As you can see, there is some black stuff remaining in it, and you can get rid of them by recrystallization in boiling water. The filtrate is a solution of potassium chloride, chlorate, and perchlorate, which can be recycled to your chlorate cell and produce more perchlorates. After drying in the oven at 150 degrees Celsius, around 8 grams of mass was lost, indicating that finely divided potassium perchlorate bonds quite strongly to water, and drying at high temperatures is probably necessary. Finally, 26.79 grams of dry and pulverized potassium perchlorate was received and stored properly. The yield is decent at 63.2%, assuming 100% purity of chlorate and perchlorate, and no side reactions. The potassium chlorate definitely has some water in it, so this yield is likely an underestimate. But anyways, this thermal decomposition process proved to be a viable route for the production of potassium perchlorate from potassium chlorate without platinum electrodes, as it requires no special apparatus and gives moderate to good yields. See you soon!